On your Tuesday episode of Locked On Raptors, the Toronto Raptors smack the Atlanta Hawks 139-109 on Monday night. And the big culprits in the game, if you want to call them that, were Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, and Scotty Barnes, who starred for the Raptors in this one on their way to their fourth win. We'll dig into their performances and why that trio is just so bloody awesome. Plus, is the Raptors bench maybe coming into view after a bit of a rocky start? We're starting to see some good performances from deeper down in the lineup. Plus, we got the good, the bad, and the hmm to get to on today's show as well. Thanks so much for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1272 of Locked On Raptors for Tuesday, November the 1st. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of Post Touches, my new Substack newsletter you can subscribe to by going to my pinned tweet on Twitter. That's at Woodley Sean. I'm also in my ninth season covering the Raptors for various platforms all around the internet you can also find the show on twitter at locked on raptors you can follow subscribe to rate and review the podcast for free on your favorite podcast apps and we are of course on youtube you can go hit the big red subscribe button smash it and uh, you have done a wonderful service to support the show and help grow our audience so thank you in advance for doing that all right on today's show the raptors lay the beat down on the atlanta hawks in Toronto on Monday night to close out this tough stretch of seven games that we kind of talked about coming into the year that we've talked about for the last couple of weeks and they close it out four and three with probably their most convincing win to date Uh, you know that win against the Sixers last week was damn nice too but this one felt pretty good I think maybe just because the Atlanta Hawks annoy me which I'll talk about later on Uh, but this was just a really really airtight performance by the Raptors couple wobbly moments here and there early third quarter parts of the second but for the most part they were just rock solid and the trio of Scotty Barnes Pascal Siakam OG Ananobi really were the ones who drove the bus in this one we'll talk about them off the top here also get into the bench a little bit Uh, we got the good the bad and the hmm we'll talk about why i just don't think the hawks are really all that th- serious or threatening in the eastern conference among other things in that final segment but let's get in to the big three right now shall we and maybe we should just start calling them the big three and that is of course dismissive of fred van vliet who is very good as a former all-star will probably make an all-star game at some point again here but he missed this game with lower back tightness of course had that rough game on friday said that the performance on friday where tyrese maxi cooked him and the rest of the raptors for a bazillion points on perfect shooting essentially wasn't due to the injury but uh, you know you can't be too careful with Fred Van Vliet or with any injury at this point and we saw the luxury the Raptors have in being able to rest Fred Van Vliet and still have the juice to win basketball games and that's because Pascal Siakam, Scotty Barnes, and OG Ananobi are awesome and I was just kind of thinking about this tonight just sort of ruminating and I don't have a hard list or anything like that but How many teams out there would take a different set of three players over Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, and Scotty Barnes for the next, I don't know, five years? Pascal is a top 15 player playing like a top 10 to 5 player right now. Had another great game tonight, 31, 12, and 6. Shot a little bit off 8 of 21, but got to the line 16 times, hit 13 of them. He was incredible. Once again, continues his just fantastic start. It's all just kind of ho-hum. Oh yeah, Pascal is amazing again. That's the kind of play you're talking about. Is the first pillar of that trio. You've got Scotty Barnes, who in this game goes for 21, 7, and 8. Uh, the playmaking for him in this one, really nice to pick and roll chemistry with a couple of guys, including Christian Coloco. Really awesome to see. And then, of course, the three-point shooting. Five of nine from three for Scotty Barnes in this one. Moves his numbers on the season up to 11 of 21, which, again, very small sample theater here, but it's, it's encouraging. It's very nice to see. He's super confident in the stroke. He looks more balanced with it, and he was just letting it rip tonight uh, as we record just a couple minutes after the game ended here so I'm still fresh and feeling good about it like the the three pointers that Barnes was hitting in this one too it's not just catch and shoot stuff in the flow of the offense it's okay I'm just gonna pull up because that's just I'm gonna cross this dude over step back pull up for three and that's just gonna be my bag now I'm also going to do a Kyle Lowry-esque pull up three in transition to get a two for one late in the first half 
That was ridiculous. That's very encouraging. We all know how good Scotty Barnes is. There's a chance he's the best of these three players we're talking about in a couple years' time. He's that promising, that exciting, although Pascal's setting a very, very high bar to have to clear if you're Scotty Barnes. Um, competition's good. It's not a bad thing. And then you have OG Ananobi. 5 of 10 shooting in this one, 2 of 7 from deep, but that really wasn't the story. The offense was nice in spots. You know, he did his thing. He was very large and strong and moved dudes around with his burly shoulders like he tends to do. But the defense from him in this one was just like, what are we even talking about? Is this real? Like, it's, it's 14, again, 14 points, 6 boards, 6 assists, sorry, 3 assists, and then 6 steals to go along with all of it. Just, just everywhere two blocks as well probably should have had more than six steals he had one call back on uh, kind of an iffy foul and a few more that probably could have been credited to him just really really impressive stuff from OG in this one and he's doing it a lot of it against Trey Young who as we've talked about everyone talks about is very good he scores lots of points he's a very very good basketball player he looked terrible in this game just three of 13 for him he had a triple double 14 points 10 assists 10 turnovers, the old Ben Simmons special. I actually think this might be the second time Trey Young's done this against the Raptors in his career, now that I think about it. Um, just a really, really all over the place defensive performance for the Raptors, especially OG in this one, just covering so much ground. And you have that ace in the hole against Trey Young. What was the thing we talked about on Monday's podcast with Vivek about, all right, the fast guards might be a problem for the Raptors throughout the season. That's just going to be a trouble, troublesome thing. Fred Van Vliet, great defender, not the fleetest of foot. Uh, Tr Gary Trent Jr., good at forcing steals, also not super great as a point of attack defender. And how do they get around that? Well, OG is usually their ace in the hole. He had to be their ace in the hole tonight. He was outstanding. And also credit, I think Scotty Barnes did an awesome job on Trey Young in this one. He had the original assignment. I would say the more sort of spectacular plays were on OG's account. Uh, but OG did mean thing of every Hawks player in this one. DeAndre Hunter, uh, DeJounte Murray. He, he was just all over the place. Just a, a really masterful performance. And then you have OG as that third pillar of this enormous collection of wings. What if they just built the whole plane out of wings and whatnot? Um, I guess they kind of almost do. What, whatever. Uh, but, like, it's just that combination of guys, the like the creation, the offensive enginery of Pascal Siakam, the insane upside and already incredible skill and talent and vision and playmaking of Scotty Barnes, and then the defensive just stalwartism of OG Ananobi, the offense he does provide, which is really important offense. It's not creating stuff in the half court all the time. Sometimes he's booting it out of bounds when he tries to do a little too much with it, but it's that sort of filling in the gap stuff it's the catch and shoot threes it's off of cuts it's in transition all super important to me i think tonight i was thinking about it and i think i landed on what type of sports archetype of player og reminds me of and he reminds me a little bit you know in baseball if you're a baseball fan maybe you are maybe you're not but sometimes teams will have these relievers basically just these fire breathing dragon relievers who can come out and throw like four five innings in a pinch and be very very good at it if you're a yankees fan michael king was this guy for the yankees this year just an absolute horse of a reliever came in shut games down really if he hits the game you probably stand no chance of scoring remember this guy chris davinsky was kind of like that for the astros as we remember some guys here uh very recently um that's the kind of player that og kind of reminds me of in that you know he's not your ace starting pitcher he's not the guy you're going to rely on for everything but you can't really survive without a guy like that and when you have a guy like that it not only helps you survive it also makes you just like incredibly difficult to deal with and contend with and that's og in a nutshell he's never going to be the best player on this team but he will always flirt with being the most important or one of the most important because of what he does defensively he blocked a trey young corner three tonight like he's just insane and the way that his offense kind of fills the gaps, especially when they have their full complement of guys and, and Fred's out there too, it's just a really, really valuable skill set to have. And that trio, Pascal, Scotty, OG, it was really fun to watch them cook tonight. And if you are some other team out in the league, you have to be terrified of what this trio can still become. Pascal keeps on getting better, and he's right now playing like a top 10 player whatever Scotty becomes is going to be better than what he is right now. And what he is right now is pretty awesome as well. I've had a lot of fun watching Scotty Barnes this season. I know there's some quibbling with his shot selection. The fact that he's kind of 
leaning on the jumper a little bit too often. But let me tell you, I think it's pretty awesome when he's hitting these jumpers. I'm having a good time watching it. I'm not going to complain about it right now. Process be damned. It's very, very aesthetically enjoyable and pleasing to me to watch Scotty Barnes stop and pop and you know pour threes into dude's eyes. It's awesome. So this trio, man, it's... Obviously, Fred Van Vliet is another incredibly important compliment to it. I'm not here saying that this team doesn't need Fred Van Vliet, but when you got those three guys who can kind of be the center of your universe on a given night, you are going to be in a lot of games, and you're going to win a lot of games, and you're going to win some games by 30 points like they did tonight against the Hawks, where the Hawks just really had no answers, specifically in the second half, really. But even then, 64 first half points for the Raptors, too. Um, we'll get to the Hawks and why I think maybe they're kind of butt shortly. But just wanted to sort of espouse on the incredible play of that trio of Siakam, OG, and Scotty. And again, like, put in the comments, maybe. I know there are trios out there who are very good, obviously, but you can leave in the comments if there is a trio of players you'd rather have for the next five years drop it in there because it's a very small list if there is a list at all that Siakam Barnes and OG are not more promising than for the next few years and that's not just me being like a huge homer okay like I'm, I'm I try not to be like a crazy huge homer when I break down this team but those three guys man every team in the league wishes they had those three guys on their roster we're going to continue on get into some other notes from this game particularly on the guys who comprise the bench rotation who I thought were pretty impressive in this one obviously you get the usual sus suspects Chris Boucher Precious Achua but some other good performances worked in there as well and maybe just maybe there's a bench coming into form for this Raptors team. We'll get to that in just one second here. But before we do that, I do want to tell you about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs, which is the place to help you find the right people for your team faster and for free. If you're hiring, LinkedIn Jobs is the place to go. Super duper easy. You just add your job. You put the little purple hiring frame right around it, and your LinkedIn profile will spread the word that you are hiring Simple tools like screening questions make it very easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. Maybe you're the Atlanta Hawks. You're trying to hire some wing defenders who can keep in front of one of the, just one of the Raptors trio of excellent wings. Uh, you know, DeAndre Hunter's fine, I guess, but you probably want some more. Maybe you shouldn't have traded away a whole bunch of your guys like Kevin Herter and Cam Reddish for nothing. But that's not me. I'm not Travis Schlenk, but Travis Schlenk might be in the, in the market for some additional help on the wings linkedin jobs place to go if you're travis schlank looking for wing help or if you are hiring for your business and it's why small businesses rate linkedin jobs jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors linkedin jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on nba that's linkedin.com slash locked on nba to post your job for free terms and conditions apply all right, we continue on here with your first listen of the day, digging into the Toronto Raptors 139-109 win over the Atlanta Hawks. And as much as the big three guys are the huge takeaway here, you know, credits due up and down the roster for this one. You know, even Gary Trent Jr., who I'm not really going to dig into today because he kind of just did Gary Trent Jr. stuff. He did that stuff wonderfully, hitting threes, got to the free throw line, some brazen self-creation moments that are kind of like, yeah, yeah, oh, no, 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 yeah, type situations. Um, those are all there. It was, a, it was a fine Gary game after kind of a rough one against the Sixers on Friday. So that was nice to see. But for me... The bench is kind of coming into view in some way, shape, or form. I don't know exactly how it's going to look just yet. And that's been a constant sort of question early on in the season. Who's going to be in the rotation? Where the hell's Thad Young? Why is he not playing? Why is Ken Birch getting random DNPCDs and then playing heavy minutes other nights? Like, I guess not heavy minutes, but minutes. And it's, you know, Nick Nurse has talked about it. It's going to be a little bit matchup based and it's going to be night to night. And some guys are going to play based on the matchup and some guys won't. And I think that's totally fine to, uh, as a way to use your back part of your, of your roster. But it's still been you know, too many nights where no one on the bench has really done a whole heck of a lot. And you're sitting there just kind of holding the bag. You get the starters going off and looking really great. And then, uh, you know, the, the bench guys come in and sometimes sewer it. Not the case in this one. First of all, Chris Boucher, like we might have to just start like the thinking person's campaign for Chris Boucher to be in the conversation for six man of the year. He was 
just as good as all the six men in the league last year in terms of driving winning, probably more so than most, or definitely more so than the guys who ended up being top three for the award, you know, the bucket getters and the like. Uh, Chris Boucher is a better bench player than those guys. He drives winning. He comes in, it's instant runs nonstop. He was a plus nine in this game. He's very rarely not a plus. He's like new wave Patrick Patterson uh, who can actually convert at the rim. Uh, <laughs> he was awesome. Four or six in this one, 11 points, a block, two steals. Um, you know, he had a couple of opportunities opportunities for even more steals you know he kind of falls out of bounds in a certain situation when he's chasing down a ball that type of thing but um you had the one steal in this one Malachi Flynn I believe it was kind of forced uh, a bit of a tricky pass from Trey Young it ends up being tapped away by Boucher he goes all the way and skies for a dunk where I think his head went above the rim uh really has been awesome to see Boucher pick up where he left off from last season in the few games he's played since returning last Monday uh and he is the pillar of this bench he's their best bench player and he is integral to a lot of these lineups he pairs super well with Pascal he pairs super well with everybody that's the thing he just fits everywhere his off-ball movement is dynamite he just kind of always knows where those pockets of space are to seep into um would like to see the rebounding numbers kind of tick up a little bit you know they're not they're kind of down so far in his limited action so far this season um the offensive rebounding has maybe been a little bit down as well but he got two tonight that's not bad it would be nice to see him kind of ratchet up those rebounding numbers but it's hard when precious that she was out there grabbing 22 in his midst it's difficult uh speaking of precious weird game from him thought his first half was pretty rough uh you know we've had a lot of the sort of downturns of the pressures that you a roller coaster early on this season especially on offense but on defense i mean you know a few issues here and there gets back cut a couple times there was one in the first half i think it was he got back cut by it was either Dejounte murray or deandre hunter it wasn't trey young because trey young threw the pass and never has the ball out of his hands uh but you know there, there was a baseline cut Precious kind of loses him. Pascal looks irate because how do you lose that guy cutting baseline? I think they were playing a zone at this at the time, um, and his zone just got completely walked through by a dude. And so, you know, th there's there's that to contend with. You know, the odd time here and there, but no one's perfect. Everyone makes defensive miscues. It's very hard, especially in the Raptor system. But he's got moments, man, where it just looks next level defensively and those moments tonight were often guarding Trey Young and making Trey Young look like he wanted to uh, just go home and pack up and uh, <laughs> cuddle up under a nice heavy blanket like I like to do when I'm feeling scared and sad and lonely um, really really awesome stuff it, you know just everyone guarding Trey Young tonight you really can't compliment the job the Raptors did on him enough um, and they really I think took advantage of the fact that Trey Young don't like to pass or doesn't like possessions to end without him being involved in some way shape or form uh and they really really gave him a ton of problems precious being foremost in that there's also this thing precious does where you know he'll have two or three offensive possessions a game where he just looks like the most in control beautifully like sculpted man just going up laying in a, laying in a little finger roll after a gorgeous well in control drive balanced feet on the plant on the power jump goes up lays it in he just has those moments where he looks so refined uh it's not every game not every moment not every drive by any means but when it happens and when it looks good it looks really really damn good um you know i would like to see the three-point shooting come back the volume is not really there the accuracy hasn't really been there that's going to be a big determining factor for Precious's development offensively, but we know the defense is there. We know it's nuts. And also, he had one sort of speculative dunk tonight. Didn't go down. He might have got fouled on it. He did get fouled on it. Sometimes Precious goes up for dunks where he clearly doesn't care for the life of himself or anyone near him, and I love it. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was like, I'm glad no one got hurt because the one he got fouled on, I think he got cut, like fouled on his leg. That's how high he was in the air. He was going up for the two-hander. Um, you know, he, he has those moments that just kind of pop off the screen, maybe more than anyone else in this sort of back part of the bench for the Raptors. Um, so nice, you know, not a bad Precious game, not a great Precious game, but he was positive and he offered some really, really good defense on Trey Young, so you can't complain there. Him and Boucher they're the bench rotation guys they're gonna play was I surprised that Achua didn't start tonight not really because we got Coloco to start last year last week when they were missing a starter and when, when Barnes was out but I, I do think that you know th th there's something to the idea of keeping the Boucher Achua duo together um you know I'd still probably like to see Achua start at some point here get a little bit extra run but he's got to earn it as Vivek said on yesterday's podcast maybe it's just a matter of having him earn those minutes and maybe it's just a tough love type of thing as he figures out some early season kinks 
Beyond that is where the bench gets a little intriguing. Obviously, Christian Coloco's played quite a bit. He was really good tonight in the starting five. Rim protection was awesome. Three blocks, nine boards, uh, nine points, five boards, four, seven, a couple of dunks in the pick and roll. That's really good stuff. Um, but, you know, if he's going to be in the bench rotation, that obviously becomes a problem for someone like Ken Birch, who plays a similar position. But Ken Birch was good tonight, too. He hit a corner three. That was a delight. He had a couple really nice defensive plays as well. He blocked Trey Young in one instance, and it just happened that the rebound fell to the hand and up and in. But really nice to see a Ken Birch block at the rim on Trey Young. He had a big steal in the middle of the floor as well, kind of skying and grabbing a pass. Uh, you know, I, I think Ken is looking better than he had basically at any time last year. And there will be times where he has to play, whether it's against a team with a big traditional center, whether it's, you know, the Raptors just want to kind of like go bully ball and be as big as possible. Situations like tonight where Christian Coloco, you know, kind of foul trouble here and there. Uh, you know, he's also very young and is going to make some mistakes here and there, but you easily have Birch to come in and spell him. I, I didn't hate that at all. I don't expect either Birch or Coloco to be like 20 minute a night fixtures or anything like that when they're at full health. But I thought both guys were pretty, you know, they acquitted themselves well tonight in their roles. And that is a good thing, right? If you have more guys you can trust, the more instances of these guys coming in and playing solid stretches of minutes, winning their minutes, that's only going to embolden Nick Nurse to try more stuff and try more guys and not feel like he needs to whittle his rotation down to seven or eight guys every night. Um, and even if it is a pick and choose thing based on the matchup, being able to pick and choose between legitimate options between your ninth and 13th men, that's a luxury to have. And it's not to say that they're going to get those performances every night, but with each with each one you get, the, the more confident you get that you kind of know what you'll get when these guys come into games. Um, and, you know, Kem and Coloco, for a team, that doesn't really prioritize center play to have those two guys kind of waiting in the wings when you do need some not a bad thing to have by any means um then you get you know very little garbage time from delano banton i think maybe we're seeing him kind of get excised here he hasn't really played regular run the last week or so and, and i think that's probably fair as we talked about there's not a ton i'm loving from delano banton at the moment um i would imagine he's going to get some g league time once that season gets rolling in a couple weeks here week and a half at this point i guess i think the november 10th is the first 10 out of 5 game if i read that correctly today so we'll see a little bit with how these guys are going to get cycled through and then obviously Otto Porter's hanging over all this too. He's going to be a regular fixture, you would assume, in the bench rotation. Uh, he's probably going to be a spot starter. Spot starter, <laughs> you idiot. Spot starter in in moments as well. For example, a night like Fred Van Vliet goes out, maybe you don't feel like you need a traditional center, and you want to roll out a Scotty Porter Trent Siakam OG lineup. Yes, please. I'm on board with that. That's cool with me. Um, so yeah, lots of optionality here. Again, you're not getting these performances every night, but the more you can string together, the more you feel good that you can count on your deep bench guys to actually offer you something when they come into the game. And when they're complimenting those three guys we talked about, plus Trent and Fred, this team's going to be a problem, man. I know the Sixers game on Friday was a bit of a bummer, but we've seen them play really good basketball for the lion's share of quarters and have so far this year. And they got through this stretch four and three. It's not bad at all. Speaking of which, we're going to get into bad as well as hmm and good in a different order in the final segment coming up as we round out the show and uh, put our finishing thoughts on this Raptors win over the Atlanta Hawks, which was quite fun. Uh, we'll do that in just a sec, but just a reminder, Locked On Leafs is available every single day in your favorite podcast apps as Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti document this intensely frustrating hockey team that loses to good teams or loses to bad teams and beats good teams and does fine against the medium teams. It's, uh, it's crazy, but Mike and Dave have a great beat on it and have a finger on the pulse of the team so go check out lockdown leaves every day on your favorite podcast apps and on youtube all right we continue on here to get into the good the bad and the hmm to close up the show a recurring end of game recap episode segment so let's dive in shall we to the good for me the good in this one is just it's a big picture thing and it's how the Raptors have performed in this early stretch. They're four and three. They didn't get, you know, smacked. They didn't get in a hole and lose a bunch of these games against good teams. You know, we've seen the Sixers have kind of come back out of their little slumber, and they're obviously a pretty good team. The Nets, I mean, the Nets are a whole other thing beyond basketball at this point. But beyond that, like they, they have the capacity to play a very good team play play very good basketball. They have the capacity to be excellent and 
the Raptors played a really good game against them. They lost it, whatever, but that's fine. They've looked really good for long stretches of this four and three start. You know, the first half against Miami in the first game, and then most of that Sixers game on Friday, really the only sections of games that you'd want mulligans for if you're talking about this team. And like, they, they've been really, really strong. And I think this is kind of the best you could hope for. Obviously, a couple games go the other way. You're five and two or six and one, and you're really laughing right now. But I think considering the questions about this team coming in offensively, considering the injury that they, you know, have been dealing with, with auto, excuse me, with auto Porter, Scotty Barnes misses a game. Fred Van Vliet misses a game. The fact that they're four and three and looking pretty solid and really showing some incredibly promising flourishes and pops to me is kind of all you could hope for. You hope now they get into a stretch here where they can maybe even the minutes load out a little bit. It was nice to see some garbage time tonight. Pascal only has to play 35 minutes, which is low for him. Uh, he got 33 for Barnes, 32 for OG on a night with no Fred. That's a win for sure. And if you can kind of spread out the rotation, maybe you get a little bit of a deeper team to work with going forward. Once you get Porter back as well, hopefully Fred comes back soon and you get an easier schedule coming up. I mean, there should be a bit of a run here, I would think, for this team at some point coming up soon. You can kind of sense it when the, when it runs coming for the Raptors and game like tonight is kind of usually where it gets kickstarted where everything kind of looks great and they can kind of build on that um so yeah the, the good is the first seven games this was this big vaunted stretch and it really did not feel like it was some horribly challenging gauntlet yes they played some teams that haven't exactly played amazing basketball but they also beat the cavaliers who have not lost since the raptors beat them on opening night which is certainly a feather in the cap as well and uh that leads me to the bad which Maybe this last game wasn't all that of a, much of a, a part of that gauntlet because my bad is the Atlanta Hawks roster construction and they're just general vibe. I don't know about this team, man. Like Trey Young is obviously wildly talented, more talented than maybe any player on the Raptors. And just in terms of like general offensive skill, obviously Pascal, a bit more of a all-encompassing two-way player. I would say Pascal is a better player than Trey Young is right now, and I don't think that's controversial. Um, but, you know, he's amazing. We know Trey Young can score 35 and also have 17 assists and makes it look easy at times. Not when he's being harassed by OG and Precious and Scotty Barnes and all the crew, but he, he's obviously very, very good. I just am very, very nonplussed by the rest of this roster. I think DeJounte Murray's awesome. Very good fit, I think, even with Trey Young. Makes it so their in-between lineups can hang. And, like, shout out to De DeJounte Murray. The best this team looked in this game was in that second quarter when they really came back. The Raptors uh, kind of teetered with Trey Young on the bench. They had a bit of a weird lineup out there. But DeJounte Murray got the ball humming, and, like, the Hawks played, as Alvin Williams pointed out, very aggressively on the broadcast. They actually played, like, with a spirit. They moved the ball, and it wasn't just, like, everything having to flow from Trey Young like it is for the rest of the game when he's on the floor. Um, um, and so, yeah, DeJounte Murray's good. They have good players. I like De De DeAndre Hunter. There was a time where I was a big John Collins head, maybe less so now. Dude could just not stay in front of Pascal Siakam. Clint Capella looks cooked as well. Siakam was just, like, abusing him. He, he obviously he didn't score every time he, like, cooked Capella in the middle of the floor, but he did it a few times. He didn't couldn't convert, but tough to imagine a guy looking more out of place than Capella guarding Pascal Siakam. Just really, really rough stuff for Capella. And Yekiel Kongu is really exciting, but then after that, like, this roster drops off a cliff in terms of talent. You know, Bogdan Bogdanovich, really, obviously, a, a big injury for them, but he's been injured for the last, last two seasons, so what are you even going to get from him? Um, he's not, obvi not obviously the greatest defender in the world. And then, like, he just... Couldn't this team use Kevin Herter? Like, why did they trade Kevin Herter? Why are they hoarding Holiday Brothers? Like, this just... It doesn't feel like a very inspiring 7 through 15 on this roster. And this is a team that seemed like it kind of had it all made. You got Trey, you have all these really good players on decent contracts. They were kind of in a position like the Raptors, maybe less high-end talent after their number one guy than the Raptors have, I think. But still, like, they were in this spot. We can do anything. We can trade for anybody. We get all our picks, and then all of a sudden, they trade all their picks for DeJounte Murray. And while that trade, I think, is a good move in terms of, like, the quality of player improving the team, they're kind of now stuck with this team and really hoping that Jalen Johnson can, you know, grow as a player and really hope a Kongu can take the next step, which I think he will. I think he's awesome, but he kind of has to because Clint Capella is cooked. And 
I just I don't think this Hawks team is on the same level as some of the other teams in the Eastern Conference that have been kind of the boogeymen that we've been talking about in relation to the Raptors, right? Like, I think I'd firmly put them below based on early impressions, but I just also like roster construct roster construction, the defense that I don't know if they can actually build around Trey Young with how like this whole team is Trey Young and then a bunch of high-waisted dudes who love to get blown by. <laughs> and then DeAndre Hunter and DeJounte Murray trying to fix things. But it's just kind of a rough state to me, It just watching this team come together. And it feels like they kind of bungled this one. I, I don't know. if I, I, I'm curious to know how Hawks fans feel because it doesn't feel like this roster is nearly as potent as it felt like it was a couple of years ago. They trade Cam Reddish for a first, and that doesn't really work out. Um, you know, they trade away, obviously, Kevin Herter because of the tax. It's kind of their main thing. Kevin Herter's looked pretty awesome for the Kings. He looked pretty damn good on this team, as he did before. Um, I don't know. I, I just I don't think I'm putting the Hawks in that tier. I th- they're kind of more towards, like, the Bulls-Knicks group to me than they are with, like, the Cavs and the Heat and the Bucks and the... I guess the Nets are kind of their own thing too. God, the Nets are a bummer. But um, yeah, I, just the Hawks to me, they're the bad. They, 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 I'm not scared of the Hawks. The Raptors seem like that's a matchup. Like if you can get that matchup somehow, you'll be laughing if you're the Raptors. Um, I'm sure they'll win plenty of games because Trey Young can do the thing. But this defense is just never going to be that good. And it was just a, a, a run of blow buys for basically every Raptors wing in this one. And, uh, you know, they didn't even have to target Trey Young. That's the crazy thing. So yeah, not not awesome. My hmm, to close this one out, thing I'm a little interested by that I'm going to keep an eye on was the Scotty Christian Coloco pick and roll chemistry. A couple of instances of Scotty hitting Coloco on the roll for dunks. And, you know, that's what happens, I guess, in part because Scotty is going to demand a lot of attention. He saw sort of uh, like basically like a very weak double team on the second one uh, where he ran where it ran it with Coloco and just kind of threw the pass over the two defenders sort of sprawling out his way kind of lackadaisically got it to Coloco Coloco throws down the dunk Coloco was looking to dunk everything tonight he probably could have had like three or four more dunks he just missed them or or bricked them or couldn't quite come up with it but um, you know that combination with Scotty's nice and the fact that Coloco was kind of learning the ins and outs of being a typical dive man it's a nice little wrinkle for the Raptors to add in in, and if Barnes is going to be bombing threes and pulling up like a madman, that makes that pick and roll operation that much more dangerous with him and anybody. You throw him and Pascal Siakam out there, that pick and roll could be dynamite, especially if you're doing it in a situation where the two defenders are not like sized, which sometimes they will be, but guess what? OG's out there too. You're not always going to have enough like sized defenders to guard all of the Raptors' dudes. And if Scotty Barnes can become a reliable pick and roll operator and use that extra shooting that not even just, I don't think he's going to shoot 50% all year. That would be crazy. But if he's just aggressive looking to pull up like he has been so far this year, that's a whole other wrinkle that you have to figure out if you're a defense. And that makes him that much more potent as a ball handler working pick and roll as the pick and roll initiator. So uh, that's just got my attention. I'm going to keep an eye on that for sure. Um, and, you know, it's a little different. that You, you can't just transmute Coloco's pick and roll success with Barnes over to Coloco and say Fred Van Vliet because Barnes is nine inches taller than Fred Van Vliet and it's a very different situation. But Coloco's kind of figuring out those beats and the guys are looking for him. If he can get that lob chemistry down with with, with Fred, that which has been a little bit off so far this year. We saw that last year with Fred and Precious, and that came along, so I have pretty high hopes for how that'll work over the course of the season in the long haul with Fred and Coloco, but um, really good stuff. Enjoyed what I saw from Coloco in this one for sure, and while I wasn't like itching for him to start necessarily, I'm glad that we got to see a pretty good performance of him from him nonetheless, and that was great. Uh, and with that, we're going to round up the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. This was a fun game to talk about. I feel buzzy. I'm talking about the freaking uh, <laughs> the trio of dudes and see Occam Barnes and OG. It's a delight. Uh, we'll be back again on tomorrow's show with another delight, Katie Heindel. We're going to have her on the pod as for our usual whatevs Wednesday. Uh, so we'll dig into some sort of big type of topic around the Raptors. Looking forward to that. Thursday, Jamar Hines is going to pop on. We're going to dig into the Raptors game against the Spurs Wednesday night. And then Friday, hoping for another guest in the, hopefully we're getting a little bit of a pattern to the week here on the podcast. So look forward to that on Friday. With that, around it there go make your second listen of the day locked on sports today it's our daily download of everything that happened the night before in the nba the nfl mlb nhl all of it it's all covered there on locked on sports today your daily download of the sports world the night before become the smart person at your water cooler would you 
We'll round it there. We'll talk to you Tuesday with another episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks so much for tuning in. Subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. You're the very, very best. We'll talk to you Wednesday. Bye-bye.